This is our fourth message in the book of Ephesians. We come today to chapter 3, verse 16. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. Notice, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power. The NIV reads, out of, instead of the literal, according to. Out of really changes the message that God wants us to get from him here. There's a big difference between God giving you strength according to the riches of his glory, or simply out of the riches of his glory. If I have... If I have ten hundred, or I have, if I have ten billion dollars, I have ten billion dollars, and you don't have anything, and you ask me to help you meet your bills, and I say, okay, here's five dollars. I gave you five dollars out of a hundred billion. You would say, well, that's nice, appreciate it, you gave me out of your riches. If I give you a blank check, I say, take it and use as much as you need. You would say, thank you, you gave me according to your riches. According to. When somebody has an infinite amount of riches, according to is a blank check. Here, take the use as much as you want. And ten hundred billion dollars is an infinite amount of riches as far as I'm concerned. The point is this. God is omnipotent. His power is infinite. He has all the power in the world. He gives us power according to the measure of power that he has, meaning this. We have at our disposal enough power and strength to do whatever he says is right. 17. And that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love. Now, notice he says, that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. You say, well, you mean I have to become strengthened on my inner being, according to verse 16, to a certain point, and then Christ will move into me? No. No. Every Christian has Jesus literally living inside of them. This verse is talking about Christ feeling at home inside of the Christian. It is talking about Christ being comfortable living inside of us because we are living holy lives. Jesus does not feel at home in us unless the Holy Spirit is controlling our lives. If you have ever been someplace where you are not really wanted maybe you were invited out of I don't know just felt that it was the right thing to do or something well if you're not really wanted someplace you know how out of place and uncomfortable that feels that's how Jesus feels in Christians when they tolerate sin in their lives and do not confess it which is well I guess they don't want me here. Feel out of place. So he says, And that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, that's what needs to happen. If we are not rooted in God's love for us, then the least little thing will send us into a spiritual tailspin. God wants us to know that His love for us is absolutely unconditional. 
even when we act unlovable, God's love for us never skips a beat. We can't possibly have the deep joy and peace that God wants us to have unless we know for sure that we are grounded in His love through Jesus Christ. Look at the last part of verse 17 and then 18. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and width and height and depth. Still talking about God's love. Long, high, and deep. Here in verse 18, refers to God's love being infinite. It is infinitely long, it is infinitely high, it is infinitely deep. Meaning, God's love touches everything. All humans are loved by God. All the animals, every part of His creation, it is all touched by the love of God. God does not care who He loves. He is not fussy about who He loves. He loves the most important executive on Wall Street. He loves the President of the United States. He loves the dictator in some two-bit little nation somewhere. He loves the person who sleeps on a park bench all night because he doesn't have a home. God loves those who serve him and he also loves those who reject him. We can block the benefits of God's love through our disobedience but we cannot stop God from loving us verse 19 and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge how are you going to know something that surpasses knowledge here's how you want to know the amazing love of God for you that surpasses our knowledge here's how you do it you begin by submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of your life. And you will experience a tidal wave of God's love. You submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of life and you're going to feel His love when you praise Him. You will feel His love when you read the Bible. And when you know that He loves you, you're going to love Him back. At that point, you will know God's love in a supernatural way that cannot be explained but only experienced. And to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To be filled with joy means to be controlled by joy. To be filled with wine or strong drink means to be drunk. To be filled with anger needs to be controlled by anger. To be filled with God needs to be controlled by God. That means self is not calling the shots. It means that our life revolves around what God wants, not what we or someone else may want. Fill yourself with praise. Fill yourself with prayer. Fill yourself with worship. Fill yourself with the Word of God. Because those good things will flush sin and self-will out of your soul. And then you're going to be filled with God. And then you'll experience His love. And then you'll experience His joy. It doesn't come automatically. 20. Now to Him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Hold it right there. God wants to do what is best for you. Not only does He want to do what is best for you, He is always able to do what is best for us. Never doubt those things. He wants to do what's best for us. He's always able to do what is best for us. All you have to do is look at His creation and, and you quickly come to the conclusion He can do anything. You know, the biggest star known to astronomers is a star called Epsilon. Epsilon. Huge. I think I read somewhere that our sun, if it was hollow, could hold 300,000 Earths. 300,000 planet Earths inside of our sun, if it was hollow. 
Epsilon, if it was hollow, could hold 27 billion of our suns. Can you just imagine that? That's just one star. God made it, along with everything else, all the other stars, with his spoken word. I think he can handle doing anything that we need. If you can imagine it, God can do it. You say, well, that's the problem. I can't imagine a way out of my mess. Mess. I can't imagine it. Well, that's no problem. He can do what is beyond our imagination. His power is bigger than even our imagination. 20. Now, to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you. According to the power that works in us. God can do anything in us, through us. Now, if you're a Christian, do not say, I can't. Do not say, I wouldn't. Do not say, God can't. Do not say, God wouldn't, unless you're talking about sin. Otherwise, do not say, I can't, or I wouldn't. Because when we are totally surrendered to God, God will use us in ways we never dreamed. To do things we never thought we could ever do. And when he does, we're going to be happy that he did. Chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Our calling, the calling that we have received, is the calling to be the children of God. And he says, walk worthy of that calling. That's not really too much to ask. Think about it. God does not want some morally depraved, vulgar, self-centered person running around saying that they are a Christian. You don't want some vulgar, morally depraved, self-centered person running around claiming to be your child. I'll bet you. That's embarrassing. If I go to a restaurant and the guy cooking is pierced, pierced eyes, pierced nose, pierced ears, pierced lips, pierced cheeks, full of piercings. He's got long, greasy, filthy hair and a dirty face. I'm not eating. But you're not going back. I don't want I don't want his hepatitis. He works at a restaurant. He has uh, some standards to uphold. Now, if restaurant workers need to have standards, how much more should those who claim to be Christians, child of children of God, have standards? We represent God. Then he says, shows us how. Verse 2, with all humility. There's a standard we should live up to. It is what Jesus displayed. Have all humility. Humility in every area. Look at Jesus. He is our creator. Because he is our creator, when he was here, he had rights. He had the right to be worshipped, the right to be waited on, the right to have his own way. But he did not demand his rights because he was humble. Instead of demanding people bow before him, instead of demanding that people serve him and that he have his own way all the time, he served others. He gave up his rights and he served others. How sickening it is. When I hear evangelical Christians, self-centered, self-esteemed Christians, encouraging self-assertiveness training, what in the world is that? I'll tell you what it is. It is the opposite of Scripture. Self-assertiveness training. Can you imagine Jesus doing that? I wish Christians like that would take their ideas someplace else and maybe start cultivating some humility and quit demanding their so-called rights and be more like Jesus, be humble. Because that's what the Bible commands us to do right here. I'm not saying you let people sin against you without confronting them. That's biblical. You have to do that. But it's talking about demanding your own way, demanding your rights. What? God says, be humble with all humility and gentleness. Gentleness is power under control. 
some translations translate it meekness power under control a gentle Christian is like a race car has plenty of power but that power is harnessed and it is under the control of a driver plenty of power you know you could hop in a race car floor it and smash it right into a wall it's got enough power to do that but it's under the control of a driver and a gentle Christian one who is full of the Holy Spirit is not weak they are strong, they are powerful but they are also under the control of the Holy Spirit that means they use their strength and express their emotions such as anger, whatever in a biblical way be gentle express your emotions in a biblical way with all humility and gentleness with patience God wants us to be patient Patient. it is a command and patience is this here it is keep behaving the way God wants us to behave even when it's not appreciated even when there are no immediate rewards keep obeying keep believing keep behaving the way God wants us to behave even as if instead of a pat on the back you get a kick that's patience with no sign of rain Noah continued to build his boat for 400 years simply because God wanted him to do it no immediate rewards nobody appreciated it and he continued to do that for 100 years that's patience with all humility and gentleness and patience accepting one another in love or forbearing one another in love if you love someone you're going to put up with their faults you're going to put up with their deficiencies if you love them because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins that doesn't mean making excuses for someone's sin God never says sinful behavior is okay it's no big deal it is a big deal there are no excuses it is not okay sin needs to be confronted but God continues to love us even after we sin even with all of our flaws and that is what he wants us to do with others love others in spite of their flaws three diligently keeping the unity of the spirit with the peace that binds us and I will tell you something unity and peace doesn't just happen it doesn't just happen because of prayer as God says here it takes effort it takes diligence it takes effort because the natural bent of sinful human beings is to be self-centered and self-centeredness is a peace killer every time Jesus did not get revenge when his feelings were hurt he was not self-centered he did not demand his rights he was not self-centered he was not a self-assertive there could only be peace between people when they are determined to put the other first and to serve each other and to consider one another better than themselves which is what God commands us to do that's the key to peace and unity not necessarily uniformity but unity verse 4 there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope at your calling every Christian has the one and only spirit of God living in them think of that the mind the emotion the will of God that's what makes up God's personality it is inside of Christians his mind his emotions his will is inside of you now if every Christian would listen to the Holy Spirit instead of suppressing his voice with their own emotions their own thoughts and their own desires every Christian would get along that is why it is impossible for a husband and wife who know the Lord and are walking in the Spirit to not get along even when they have disagreements it will be a kind disagreement and it will be worked out through humility verse 4 again there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope at your calling there is one hope that every true Christian has 
and it is a unifying thing among Christians and our hope is to experience the Lord our hope is heaven our hope is holiness our hope, be, our hope is happiness in eternity our hope is a new body on a new earth and it's not just oh boy I, I wish it happens or I, I wish it would happen or I, I, sure, I sure hope it happens it's not that it, it's a solid fact that it will happen and it's our hope and Christians are united in things that we hope for and we look forward to consequently we can all look forward to those things together we have that all in common you see this is where you can talk about those things and pray for those things together and that makes Christians want to be around other Christians you get together with another Christian who believes the word of God it's fun you're excited you talk about the good things that are coming five there's one Lord one Lord just like there's one brain in your body one our, our one brain commands the parts of our body to work together for good that's why if I have a headache if I have a headache my hand grabs a couple of aspirins puts it in my mouth and then I swallow and then my blood goes to work moving that aspirin stuff around and it finally gets to my head see how the body works together if a mosquito is biting my left hand my right hand will swat that mosquito and kill it because there's one brain and it controls all the parts of my body and they work for the benefit of each other there is one brain for the body of Christ as it were one Lord for the body of Christ and it is Jesus if every Christian listened to the Lord then we would be unselfish we would be as concerned about other Christians as we are ourselves because Christ our Lord would lead us to be that way that's why the, the reason there cannot be true unity between Christians and non-Christians is because we receive our orders from a different Lord the only way Christians can have complete unity and harmony with non-Christians is if the Christians throw the truth out the window five again one Lord there's one faith one faith that's talking about orthodox historically accepted biblical truth there are certain fundamental teachings that a person must accept in order to be a Christian there's one body of truth and it is found within the 31 verses 31,000 verses of Holy Scripture so there is one Lord one faith and it says there is one baptism too one baptism water baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit done by the authority of Jesus Christ is a command from God it is also a unifying thing it is something that every Christian should have in common or does have in common verse 6 one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all some says wait a minute that sounds like pantheism no pantheism teaches that God is in the trees God is in the grass each blade he is in each and every snowflake and he's in everything else and everyone else pantheism teaches that there's a little piece of God in this blade of grass and a little piece of God in the next one and a little piece of God in you and a little piece of God in a tree and whatever else a cloud every drop of water and when you combine it all together well then you have the total God all things put together is God that's what pantheism teaches that's not what this verse is teaching that's wrong you can't believe in the Bible and believe in pantheism because the Bible says in the beginning God created everything which means that he was before the material universe and he is not the material universe he was before it and he's also separate from the material universe so yes God is everywhere he's omnipresent he's everywhere at the same time but he's a hundred percent everywhere at the same time and he doesn't live inside of everything only inside of Christians and not everything put together is God so 